I would like to tell you about an envelope. Yes, an envelope. That completely changed my life. It looked a lot like this one, actually. But before I do that, I'd like to take you back to Ghana. So I grew up in Tema, a small industrial town just off the east of the capital, Accra, for those who know. I grew up with my paternal uncle and his wife. Uncle Ernest was, was a businessman, and my auntie Linda was a teacher. Although I wasn't their son, they treated me as if I was, and, and they, they showed me love and placed great importance on my education. I remember having to practice my times tables every night, actually. I'm not sure if I've got the sevens still, right, but it's not too bad. Hello, mom. <laughs> so at nine, I came to, I came to the UK, London, uh, joining my mom and my sister who are here today. And my mom was a hairdresser at that time, which explains the wacky where hairstyles that I've got going on here. But um, she placed great importance on our education too. So I went to Shakawa Primary School, which is five minutes down the road, actually. And at first, it was a bit weird, you know? I was teased a bit, uh, mainly because of my accent. And at 11, I went to secondary school, and things didn't change there either. But by year nine, things did start to change. Thanks to my friends and my teachers at Mossbourne Community Academy, I was beginning to find my feet. Just like my family, they were ambitious for me, and I responded to that. I worked hard, and at GCSEs, I achieved AA stars and four A's. I went on to... <laughs> Thank you. I went on to study maths, physics, chemistry, and product design. My ambition was to become a scientist. So by this time, I surrounded myself with friends who were just as ambitious for themselves as I was for myself. OK, let's open this envelope. All my friends had made it into their universities of choice. Massimo, who's over there. What's up, Massimo? Massimo got into Oxford to study medicine. Jelani got into Cambridge to study law. Catherine was off to Manchester to do engineering. Tearing off that brown seal of the envelope felt like an eternity. When I finally got the courage to open it, though, I was elated. I had made it. I got the grades to study chemistry at Imperial College London. Now, for those who don't know, Imperial College London is one of the best universities in the world to study a science-related subject. So you can see why I was pretty happy in that picture. This elation was short-lived. Yes, I had the grades. Uh, yes, I had a university place. But what I didn't have, as I was quick to find out, was the right to a student loan, without which it would be impossible for me to, to carry on my studies. I mean, this, this was crazy. I've lived in the, UK, in the UK for half my life at this point, and I was finding out that not only uh, was I not entitled to a student loan, but on top of that, I was finding out that I was being treated as an international student. I was, that was shocked. I didn't see myself as any different to my friends, Massimo, Jelani, Catherine, or any of the young, ambitious, uh, talented people in my class. So this came as quite a shock to me. What came as even more of a shock was when I realized that being seen as an international student meant Imperial could charge me international student fees. Now, instead of the £9,000 charged to home students, this was £27,000. Yeah, I know, I heard someone say, Jesus. <laughs> That's exactly what I said when I saw the, the, the amount as well. 27,000 pounds a year in tuition fees alone. Plus, of course, there will be uh, living expenses on top of that. I was devastated. I mean, I knew there was no way my family could come up with that kind of money. Just to put that into context, that is three times the fees charged to, to a home student. So yeah, I told you I've been practicing my times tables. It's good. <laughs> Uh, and also, it's £10,000 more than the annual income of, of someone working at the London Living Wage. I, I didn't know where this money was going to come from. I was desperate, very desperate, but giving up was not an option. I contacted as many people as I could, uh, the Hackney Learning Trust, local MPs, uh, my old principal, anyone, anyone who could help. No one could understand the situation any better than I could. No one had any help to give me. I was lost. As someone who found it difficult to confide in others anyway, this was a pretty dark time for me. I mean, I would, I would go days without saying a word to anyone, you can ask my mom, and, and it didn't help, you know, seeing the pictures and the posts of all my friends at their universities having a good time, whilst I was stuck at home with no future in sight. This was a very difficult time for me, as I said. 
I mean, all my life, my family had instilled in me the belief that if I worked hard uh, and studied hard, I could achieve everything I wanted to achieve. But it felt as if they were wrong and, and my future was just slipping out of my hands. So why was I in this position? I was in this position because of a law change which took place in 2011. Uh, it narrowed down the student loan criteria and it meant that legal migrants, just like myself, were no longer eligible to a student loan. So we weren't British enough for a loan, but we were British enough to work, uh, we were British enough to pay taxes, and we were British enough to join the British Army. Yes, I know, so I was a bit confused myself. <laughs> it made no sense. Coming across the Let Us Learn campaign, however, changed my life, literally. The campaign was set up by young migrants just like myself who had been affected by the same situation and who were coming together to try and do something about it. For the first time, I heard the stories of, of, of many people who had been affected by the same situation as I was. I cannot tell you how important that was for me. It made me realize I wasn't alone. Um, they, they felt like a second family to me, sorry, and we were all there for each other, seeing as we'd been through similar stories. This strong sense of family was illustrated in the summer of 2015 when uh, we all went to the Supreme Court. So that's 40 of us at the Supreme Court, and we went because the court was hearing a judgment, uh, a challenge, sorry, to the, to the student loan criteria, which was brought to them by a young lady called Boris Tagere. Now, Boris Tagere had lived in the UK since she was four years old, but surprise, surprise, she was being blocked from accessing student finance too. Some of our cases were being used as evidence in, in courts, which was brilliant. But we wanted to turn up in person, protest, so that the judges could see for themselves how important this issue was for so many young people across the UK. So that was the hearing. We went back a few weeks later for the judgment, and we won. We actually won. This is our first... Thank you. Thank you. We won. This, this was our first major victory. It's rare that cases against government legislation win at the Supreme Courts, but we managed to do it. So the judges uh, decided that the student loan criteria were too narrow and the government had to do something about it. Well, I don't know if it was the sight of us in a courtroom that managed to persuade them, but we think we should take some credit for that. <laughs> so this was an important victory, but it was, it was a partial one, you know? The subsequent changes in the law opened up student finance for some of the Let Us Learn campaigners, but not all of us, including myself. My situation in practical terms was unchanged. But this win sparked a wave of hope for the whole group, and for me personally, inspired me to keep fighting and, and, and to keep trying to find, find a solution to my problem. So this is what I did. I deferred my entry for two years, and I took on a job as a, as a teaching assistant at my old school. I'd like to thank them for that, actually, because it helped me out a lot. But my wage was still only half of what I needed for one year's tuition, so there was, there was a large gap to bridge. But working with the Let Us Learn campaign opened up a huge network of people and provided the support I needed to think of a way out of my situation. I decided to go for crowdfunding. So six months of intense planning finally paid off. And I'd like to thank people like Shawneen, Dami, Joel, Fiona, Sarah, Rupa, so many people, and especially my mom, because without their relentless support, I would not have been able to raise 26,000 pounds in the space of six weeks. We managed to do this, and thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. We, we managed to do this, and, and I was amazed. Uh, I was even more amazed because uh, through scholarship hunting, the TCO Foundation also stepped in and, co and covered my tuition fees for the whole three years. So 27,000 pounds for three years. I was, I was going to uni. I was so happy. So that was in 2015. Uh, I am now in my second year studying chemistry at Imperial College London. The workload is mad. <laughs> the workload is mad. But I'm loving it. I'm enjoying it. You can check out my blog to see what I've been up to. Uh, it's great. But, you know, I wake up sometimes and I think, what about all the other 2,400 young people a year being blocked from accessing higher education in a country they call home? I'm not claiming to be an expert on the English language, but, and correct me if I'm wrong, feel free, but a loan means money you have to pay back, right? Is, is, is that right? Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, and I got that right. And as a graduate, you contribute more into the economy than someone without a degree. So from the government's point of view, this, this made no sense either. What I experienced was not a glitch in the system. There are calculated structures embedded in every layer of society designed to present a barrier to no one else but migrants. It is clear whether you're in, the, in Aleppo facing a refugee crisis or, or you're in, in the US, like the, the Dreamers, a similar campaign to ours, it's clear that odds are greatly stacked against migrants globally. From the physical barriers in, in the form of the magical Game of Thrones walls that some politicians want to build, or the social barriers, you know, re uh, fortified in the rhetoric, rhetoric in the media, all of which fuels a very, very toxic attitude towards migrants globally. People move. Throughout history, people have moved. You know, sometimes they're, they're fleeing from something, sometimes they're being drawn towards something, but they move. They always have, and, and they always will. I may be seen as, as an international student, but I've lived in this country long enough to know that what makes it such a beautiful place to live in is its people. You know, just looking here already, the diversity and, and the acceptance of others. A recent post-Brexit poll showed that 18 to 34-year-olds put cutting net migration at the bottom of a list of 22 priorities. And this is weird, because it seems like the exact opposite of what the government's doing. But I feel like the government should be more trusting of its people and, and, and less fearful in its policy making. But back to me, what have I learned? Oddly enough, I've learned that an envelope can change your life. An envelope can bear good news when it tells you all your hard work has paid off and all your dreams and ambitions might come true. But they can have other uses too, negative ones. I sometimes feel as though governments too often use the back of envelopes to draw up its half-baked policy changes without thinking twice about the impact it's gonna have on people's lives. This is what happened to myself and the Let Us Learn campaigners when they changed the rules around student finance. I can't comprehend what, what uh, refugees and asylum seekers have to go through as they have to contend far worse inhumane uh, um, immigration policies. But I'd like to leave you with this. If you are passionate about changing society for the better, you are not alone. Find others however you can and most importantly, keep fighting. Please keep fighting. Because as Martin Luther King once said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Thank you very much.